Good afternoon, uh, and thanks again for having me. A uh, couple disclosures. One maybe is relevant. Um, I did uh, design a sacral pelvic set, um, but I will not be uh, talking about any one device company uh, today, and you won't be able to tell which one that was. So. So I always start my sacral pelvic talks with the same case because it's an interesting one. Uh, it's a 55-year-old female that came in. She had a spondylolisthesis, uh, ended up with an L4 to S1 fusion, and uh, and came to us really pretty miserable. Uh, now she had a an isthmic spondy at 5.1, not the biggest of slips. Uh, her preoperative films weren't all that bad, but she underwent this surgery and ended up like this. And I don't know if you can tell what's going on here, but her. Um, her alignment is significantly poor where her she's got a, a big mismatch between that pelvic incidence and that lumbar lordosis. And what happened is they fixated down to S1, which we know the sacrum isn't the strongest of fixation point. Uh, isthmic spondylolisthesis can be a high demand construct. And she failed. She fractured below there and then healed in kyphosis. So she uh, had an iatrogenic increase in her pelvic incidence because her S1 end plate tipped down. Uh, and when that happens, now her pelvic incidence is abnormally high and, and she's in trouble because she, despite having a lot of lumbar lordosis, cannot get back uh, to upright no matter what she does. So figuring out how to deal with this is a, is a complex thing and it brings up a lot of these sacral pelvic fixation points. Uh, what is her bone quality? Probably not that great. Um, how are we going to get her sagittal balance back and what are we going to do for fixation now that we're already down to S1 and we are failing? So. The problem is the sacrum isn't that great a fixation point. We end a lot of our constructs at the sacrum, but it's not very good. And if you look at those uh, images there, you can see the varying degrees of bone loss you can see through that sacrum. It's mostly cancellous bone. There isn't a pedicle really to fill like there is on, in a uh, regular pedicle screw. Your strength of your pedicle screws comes from filling the channel with a screw where you get engagement of the cortical bone all around. You cannot get that in the sacrum. There's, there's no channel to fill. You can't get a screw that's big enough uh, to fill that to that cortical bone. And it also sees a lot of force. Uh, our center of gravity falls just in front of what we talk about that uh, sagittal vertical axis. So those are not the same line. And so every time you're standing up, your center of uh, Gravity is a little bit in front. When you go to get out of a chair, when you go to start walking and you lean forward, you are putting a lot of uh, uh, stress right down at the caudal aspect uh, of that uh, of that construct, which is is the sacrum. So there's a lot of ability to cantilever those screws. You're adding a cantilever force to them, and you can plow those screws through that sacrum pretty easily. So when we talk about sacral fixation, right? We're going to talk about pelvic fixation for a lot of this, but we're really the sacrum is the end fixation point of a, of a construct, and there are a variety of options. S1 screws are by far the best, so we'll talk the most about those. But there are other options you should know about. S2 pedicle screws, traditional ALAR screws, not an S2 ALAR iliac that we'll talk about later. Uh, there are intrasacral rods, combination of sacral iliac screws, some combo plates uh, that existed that uh, most people do not use uh, today, but they're certainly there. You'll see them in some revisions sometimes. You need to know what they are so you, need, so you can revise them. Um, and we look at it, the S1 screw is the strongest fixation point. And that little graph there you see is the um, uh, tricortical versus bicortical fixation. And you, that's the study, that's the picture from that, that study by Ron Lehman. Uh, and the tricortical screw is getting uh, the posterior cortex, which you get with every screw. Then you get the anterior cortex, but right at that junction of the disc space, right at the end plate. So you're getting the, the kind of the end plate and then the front of the bone. So that's why it's called tricortical. That bone is really dense right there uh, versus that lower screw, which is just bicortical. And you can see the significant increase uh, in, that, in the strength of that screw if you have tricortical fi fixation. That's the a bigger view of that. So um, since you can't fill that pedicle, you really need to get, you absolutely need to get bicortical fixation. But the closer you get to that, that sacral promontory, the better off you are. So and really, when we talk about this, getting S1 screws, it's key to get good S1 screws. They shouldn't be going straight in. They need to be medialized. Um, usually, I start at the inferior um, aspect of the, the joint. So I think of the sacral ala very much like a transverse process in the lumbar spine. Uh, I freehand all my screws. I freehand my sacral screws. Um, when you're in the lumbar spine, you're usually putting the, the pedicle screw at the junction of the, the um, transverse process and the facet kind of in the middle of the TP. 
Well, you're trying to get right down the barrel of a, of a pedicle when you put a pedicle screw in, so that makes sense. An S1 screw, you're not trying to get right down the barrel. You're trying to get from low to high to get to that sacral promontory. That's like putting a pedicle screw up to the, the disc space. So you start at the very bottom of that joint, uh, if that makes sense. And then you angle immediately 20 to 30 degrees, and you want to get towards that sacral promontory. You can do that under floral, you can do that under navigation, and you can do that freehand. But essentially, you want the screw track to look right like that. Um, you need to you probe that, you get a length. You want this bicortical, so if I'm putting a regular pedicle screw, I, I put a probe down, I feel for that anterior cortex. If I measure 50, I'm putting in a 45. I measure 47, I'm putting in a 45. I'm always backing off a little bit because I don't want to go bicortical on those regular pedicle screws, but I want it as long as possible. In the sacrum, if I measure 47, I'm putting 50. If I measure 45, I'm putting 50. If I measure 44, I'm not real happy, but I'm putting 45. Uh, you don't want to go more than five millimeters beyond, uh, but you want to make sure you engage that, that anterior cortex. And you can see that probe there uh, going across there. Uh, when I do a, um, a freehand screw, I use the gear shift probe just like I do. I use the lanky, the curved pedicle probe, but instead of curving it medially so the curve is bouncing off the medial cortex of the pedicle, I curve it so it's facing up. So I'm aiming up towards that disc and allowing that curve to deflect me off the end plate and into that promontory. That tends to work really well, makes that quite easy. Uh, you can feel when that starts to deflect, it starts to push your hand up a little bit, you know, and you're in the right spot, and then you just get to that, uh, that anterior cortex. So even when you place those S1 screws, well, they can fail. That's why all these other techniques exist. Uh, a poorly placed screw is going to fail a lot more often than a, than a, a well placed screw, though. Uh, screws can break. I use a 7.5 screw in all my sacral screws. I don't use anything smaller than that. They can pull out or plow. Getting bicortical fixation and good medialized trajectory helps minimize that. Uh, and they can loosen. Same, same rules apply. Here's an example. This is a 55-year-old obese female came in to me with the uh, CT scan on the left side there. Uh, obviously, that is S1 screws that have catastrophically failed, and that is really hard to fix. You can see those screws are starting to erode into the, the neural foramen, so I've got no more medial fixation at all. I can't simply upsize those screws. They don't make screws big enough to upsize and fill those holes, uh, and even if you did, you'd be putting it against the nerve root, so you can't do that. So you need to get something adjunctive, and you can see that she had a multi-pelvic screw uh, construct with a, a, a bar that goes across to give me some additional fixation points. Uh, so. Everything else we're going to talk about is adjunctive fixation. S1 screws are your endpoints. Everything else adds to your S1 screw. If you say, well, S1 seems a little difficult, maybe I'm just going to put in pelvic screws, uh-uh. They are all meant to offload your S1 screws. That's the biomechanics. They are not in place of S1 screws. They are offloading your S1 screws. So if you're trying to do, put other screws in, you're, you're missing the boat. Uh, here's an example of that. Here's a, uh, a patient that, that I was consulted on, um, had a long construct um, done for who knows what. Uh, but those S1 screws, look at them, they're going straight in. They're not very strong. Uh, they're not well medialized, right? They're not that, that great. And I was consulted, and you can see this is uh, two weeks post-op. He's still in the hospital. This guy hasn't even left the hospital yet, and I'm getting consulted on him. Um, and he's got S1 screws. You can see haloing out there. And you can see his cage in that uh, bottom left. You can get a, a pliff done. And you can see where that cage is now sitting. Those screws have haloed out and failed. So they asked a lot of that. They did a pliff. So they took down both sides of the posterior elements. So they weakened it there. Uh, and they put in S1 screws only on the long segment construct. As soon as he got up, he failed. Uh, so he gets revised to something like that with some iliac screws and an inner body uh, up front. Uh, and finally get some fusion across there. So, um, and that's a CT scan where he's now solidly fused across an inner body. He also got an infection. That's why he's got the titanium mesh in there. So uh, that's not what I would normally use, but he had an infection uh, in addition to his, his uh, they went and revised him, he got infected. Um, so we, we had to salvage it. But uh, with, again, new sacral screws and then iliac fixation to augment it. So uh, the indications for that, and uh, any long segment construct, you need to start thinking about iliac fixation. L2 is sort of the tipping point. If you're L2 and above going down to the sacrum, you really need to be thinking about iliac fixation. If you have a good A-lift cage with some integrated screws and things like that, that might mitigate that a little bit. That gives you pretty strong uh, fixation and helps offload that L5S1 uh, segment. But 
you still can sort of fracture down below there, so you need to think about that in somebody with uh, a high demand construct still. Uh, patient with osteoporotic spondylolisthesis, even if it's L4 to S1, if they have a spondy at L5 to S1, uh, I think uh, long and hard about iliac screws if it's an isthmic spondy. Um, uh, sagittal imbalance, high pelvic incidence, coronal imbalance, if you're leaving any residual imbalance, you really need to think about that. And somebody with a lot of truncal obesity with a big belly hanging up front adds a lot of strain uh, to that. So S2 pedicle screws are an adjunctive fixation. They're similar to an S1 screw, but it's much shorter. Think about how your sacrum gets much shorter there, so it's a short little screw. You can't get try that tricortical fixation, so it's not as good. Can reduce your S1 screw strain by 15 to 20%. So it helps, but it's not great. Uh, and you have to worry about your, your anterior structures a little bit more in that scenario. Sacral alar screw, uh, those go up and out as opposed to medialized, they are lateralized, uh, usually placed at S1. This is talking about an S1 alar screw. Um, you have to be careful with those screws. Some people want to place them bicortically, but your L5 nerve runs in front of your sacral alar. You have to make sure you're not hitting it. So generally, those are unicortical screws. Again, 20% reduction in some of that strain. This is something called Colorado plate that you can see there that, that has a uh, uh, screws where you can put them all in one. You put the S1 screw down the big hole and the ALR screws out the little holes. Uh, intrasacral rods, this is for historical only. This is a Jackson intrasacral rod. Essentially, you leave your rod long and you bury it into the sacrum. Uh, you might see it, so you should know it, but you'll never place them. Uh, there's far better fixation uh, techniques. Uh, the problem with those is they did, they did this. So they were here and they, they just plow to here because that's just cancellous bone they're sitting in. So you'd lose your correction if that's what you were trying to hold with. So then iliac fixation. Iliac fixation you heard earlier. Uh, Galveston rods were the first uh, iteration of that. Imagine how difficult those would be to place. You had to bend that rod. It didn't come like that. You're bending that rod, all those goofy angles, and then putting it in there, and then trying to bend it down into your construct. It was loose probably before you even put in all your set screws. Uh, but it did give some, some offload to that, so it was the start. Um, then people started talking about uh, putting what we called iliac bolts initially. They were actually smooth with just a thread at the base, uh, and then eventually iliac screws. So uh, iliac screws, why do we do them? They increase your fusion rate at L5S1 significantly. They decrease your S1 screw strain by 75% or greater. Um, there was traditionally a high complication rate, though. That was why they didn't really take off. Uh, they have screw break, back out or breakage. You're putting them across your SI joint, Right? and you're not fusing your SI joint traditionally, so they can loosen up a little bit over time. If they break or loosen over time, that can be a radiographic phenomenon that is of no clinical consequence, and you just leave it. If it causes pain, then you may need to revise it. Uh, gluteal pain used to be reported up to 18%. Newer techniques have improved that significantly. Um, if there's hardware prominence, that's a problem, so we have to be really careful with how we place them. And again, here's the flexion load to failure and some of those where I'm getting those numbers from. Uh, this is your iliac screws over here showing a, a significant decrease in strain on the, the construct there. Uh, and the reason for that is your instantaneous axis of rotation is right across here. And you're trying to get, get fixation in front of that so you get some cantilever resistance. Your iliac screws go way in front of it compared to everything else you're putting in. If you look at those S1 alar screws versus an iliac screw, you get it significantly in front of that. Uh, and it also is sitting right above your sciatic notch, which is a really hard cortical bone. So when you flex forward, that screw sits against that hard cortical bone and doesn't want to go anywhere. So to insert a traditional iliac screw, that's the trajectory you see uh, up here. Um, right near the uh, posterior superior iliac spine, uh, some people make a notch inside of it. Some people cut a notch uh, here, right at the PSIS. I do sort of a hybrid approach. I try and just leave a little bit of bone here and cut the notch so I've, I want my screw head sitting fully within the bone. People talk about hardware prominence. When I put an iliac screw in, you cannot feel it. It is sitting within bone uh, and not sticking up at all. And that's why um, I always tell people my revision rate on iliac screws is, is very low. I've had two patients where I've revised screws for, for iliac pain, um, only two. And that's with hundreds of people walking around with iliac screws. Um, and you want to pass that screw above that side of notch like we just talked about. Uh, and that's kind of what they look like there. Uh, you can harvest iliac crest bone graft. You can do a traditional iliac crest bone graft up uh, and away. When I put in a screw these days, I cut the notch out. I go harvest iliac 
crest bone with a pituitary angled cephalad in a way from where my, the trajectory of my screw. So I get enough iliac crest bone at least to fill every inner body I'm going to place. And then a little bit of adjunctive uh, that helps me reduce some of my other uh, bone graft uh, burden. Uh, and even if they've had a previous iliac crest graft, you can, in a revision setting, you can generally still place an iliac screw. So a couple quick little videos. I hope we'll skip them if they get too long. Uh, this is just showing, so that's the iliac crest there. You can see the PSIS. I generally, that's the base of it there, so I come up just a little bit, just enough to leave bone that, so it's not gonna ideally crack. Uh, I make that cut first because uh, I generally wanna cut that bone and, and get that uh, osteotome out of there before I, without cracking that. Um, and I'm a little more aggressive on that second cut, so I make one cut, two cuts, and then I come down at the base of it and cut all the way out. So I take that all the way out, and then I can lever that piece up and remove that uh, pretty large chunk uh, of that iliac crest bone there. Let's see here, I can't see my little thing. So this is getting a little bit of bone marrow going, or a little bit of the iliac crest bone going up and away. Uh, I do that until I get a decent amount, actually. Uh, you don't want to take the graft and the trajectory where your screw is going to go because that, that hurts the fixation. Uh, then taking and passing the probe. So I usually use a straight, blunt-tipped uh, probe on that one. Uh, it's generally, you think about it as kind of 45 degrees lateral, 45 degrees caudal most of the time. Uh, I will. I actually pass a jam sheet and needle, take some bone marrow aspirate out of there too. I take uh, two to four cc's out of each pass and soak it on some of my bone graft. Uh, once we cannulate that, just kind of feel that. Uh, I tap an iliac screw and then just place a screw down that tract. Uh, there's the screw going in. I place all screws under, under power. Um, And then I feel, so I make sure I can run my finger over the top and I don't feel any screw, I just feel bone there. You can see how that sits uh, within there and I put a little surgifoam or flow seal around there to, to make sure we're not bleeding out of that iliac uh, crest site. Uh, some examples, here's a patient with a uh, fairly tight little lumbar uh, curve, uh, fairly standard, just traditional iliac screws with offset connectors. Uh, S2 ALR iliac screws, that's kind of the, it's not really new anymore, but it's a, it's certainly newer than the iliac screws, um, came out of uh, Hopkins. Uh, a nice technique, it certainly has gained a lot of favor. Uh, it was developed in neuromuscular children to start, but used in, in a lot of deformity these days. It is a screw that goes through the sacrum, crosses the SI joint, and then into the, into the pelvis. Uh, that can be placed, again, under fluoroscopy. That can be placed with navigation. That can be placed freehand. Uh, a variety of ways uh, to do that. People like to use the teardrop view on, on iliac screws so you can see down, down the barrel. People like a pelvic inlet view on some of these so you can actually make sure you're not breaching into the pelvis. Uh, this screw is a little more challenging to place, I think, because you have the risk of breaking anteriorly that you don't really have on the traditional iliac screw. Um, and the angle can be a little bit difficult. You have to and you have to really drop your hand quite significantly. Uh, and as somebody with a really high iliac crest, that angle can be a little tricky sometimes. Uh, that is generally placed, if you look at that here, so you uh, take your um, sacral frame and your S1 and your S2 frame, and it's kind of bisected on the lateral margin of that. And you have to, I always place my S1 screw first. And you might want to sneak it a little more laterally if you need to, to make sure those run. The S2 AI screw often wants to sit a little medial to the S1 screw and it just gets a little finicky to go in out in with a rod bend. So you wanna make sure if you can line those up. It's generally 30 degrees from the, from the uh, floor angled out and then 10 degrees caudal is a, is a pretty good initial starting point. Uh, you're gonna pass the probe, you're gonna feel it go through the cortex of the sacrum into the SI joint, through the SI joint, and then you're back into bone. That's the feel you need to do. I tend to use an, uh, a curved pedicle probe this time, and I have it angled up, because I don't want to breach uh, anteriorly, so I angle it up until I get across, then I switch to a straight probe. Uh, again, these can be a long screw, uh, can be up to 100. I tend to place 90 for most of the time. For these, I tend to, I put an 8580 iliac screw, and I use traditional uh, the great majority of the time. Uh, again, you can see it here. Here's a couple of uh, nice views across there. So you can see it on a, uh, so the pelvic inlet view there versus the teardrop view, how you want that screw to come across the, 
SI joint and stay within that, that teardrop uh, over here on the pelvis. Uh, a lot of structures are in uh, that you need to be aware of. Uh, always when you're on the sciatic notch, you've got your uh, superior gluteal nerve, superior gluteal artery. Uh, paying attention there, make sure you're, you're careful with those. Again, there's a nice uh, pelvic inlet view of it crossing that, that joint. So when you look at the biomechanics of this, everybody's thought, well, you're going through multiple cortexes. These are going to be stronger than traditional iliac. They're really not. And again, because most of the time an iliac screw is designed as a cantilever resistor, and you're, it's getting it above the, the sciatic notch that really gives you that, that cantilever resistance. Um, if they looked at these different screws, then this one was actually a quad cortical screw uh, where they went through the sacrum in, across the joint, so two and three cortexes, then actually out the pelvis again. Uh, it didn't really add any 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 benefit. So if you just just know that if you're putting a S2 ash groove or stridulant iliac, they're about the same in terms of uh, what they get you. Uh, multiple studies, and there's biases all over the place, for and against uh, S2I over iliac. They're both good techniques. You really should know both of them and be able to use them. Um, I tend to place traditional iliacs in most patients with mobile SI joints. I don't like really putting the screw across that joint, although I think it's less of a concern uh, than I than I probably once feared, but I still, uh, I like the traditional iliac screw because they work well in my hands. Um, so when they looked at, uh, this study looked at S2I versus traditional iliac and found uh, less uh, implant loosening, uh, less breakage, less pain in fewer revisions. But whenever you read the literature, always pay attention to what they're saying. So uh, less loosening, less breakage. Uh, you know, they talk about zero revisions and then they have this x-ray as, as an example there. I don't know, but it, I would tend to revise that if they both broke like that um, across that joint, but, and the S1 screw is broken as well. So that obviously, f the construct is failing, so that seems like it would need a revision. But, um, so I always pay attention to the, the films they show, I don't know what they say. <laughs> Maybe, exactly. Yeah. No, no. So there, there's like everything. There's the there's the excitement phase, and then we're starting to come back to reality a little bit. It's it's not the be all end all. Um, again, here's another screw. They say, well, they you know they really don't break at the joint. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I agree. Again, I'll show you a couple other ones. Um, <laughs> he doesn't agree with anyone. No, no, so they, they break, right? They, they definitely, right, they do break. Here's another example of a screw broken right at that joint. And my concern is if this is painful, getting that screw out is almost impossible. You can't get that distal, distal screw out. Uh, so, uh, and again, so we heard early reports, well, the screws don't really break. They don't really have any problems. But then this screw exists. So this screw exists with a extra thick, it doesn't, have, it doesn't have threads because if you look at it, that's all the outer diameter is all solid there. And that one's not even an S-way. You see, it's too lateral. It's like how someone join on that. Yeah, but that's their, that's their specialized screw, which, again, you just got to use some common sense. You don't invent a specialized screw if the first one wasn't having problems, right? If the first one was, wasn't breaking, you wouldn't design this one because it costs more money to redesign a new screw. Uh, so... So they break. Um, this is a, a, a new study that actually came out. This is not S2I versus traditional iliac. This is S2I versus uh, fusion of the sacrum. Kind of interesting. SI joint pain. More SI joint pain if you fuse to S1 versus L5 or the pelvis, which makes sense because you're, you're loading the SI joints with the fusion to S1. So adding adjunctive fixation tends to help that. Um, this is a, this, I don't know if any of you guys got the invitation for this uh, new study group they wanted to form. They're looking at these clinical trials. So if you think S2AI isn't causing pain uh, at the ileum or at the SI joint, this is a study looking at, they want to do this randomized trial looking at S2AI alone versus S2AI putting a SI bone implant in at the initial surgery. So you do a deformity construct, you put your S2AI screws, you do a SI fusion at the very same time. 
Um, which again, you wouldn't do that if you weren't having some problems with it. So, uh, so everything that says there's a 0% rate of this, 0% rate of that, uh, I would tell you, get good at both techniques. You'll need to use both in certain circumstances, but you, but uh, there is not one be all end all. And the S2I can cause pain at the uh, sacroiliac joint that you just need to need to be aware of. Some of the studies that looked at uh, the failure, this is a, a study that showed the opposite where the S2I feel much higher than the iliac screws. Again, uh, I think you have to be good at placing both. Um, this is S2I versus uh, traditional iliac screws. Uh, looking at complications and revision rate, iliac screw, 48% revision rate, 44% infection rate. This came out of Hopkins. So. Um, I would tell you if I had a 44% infection rate, I'd stop doing whatever it was and come up with a new technique, uh, right? I mean, that's, that's crazy, but it's a biased study uh, like everything else. These are probably, they're putting in traditional iliacs in their sacrectomy patients where they, right? It's a totally different patient population than the deformity population. Uh, and then they showed this paper looking at implant prominence and how it's much less prominent. Absolutely, if you're placing it old-fashioned style with a screw sitting on top of the bone. Those are prominent and painful and have a 20% revision rate. If you bury them down within the bone, a traditional iliac is no more prominent than an S2AI, uh, which both can be relatively low-profile constructs, and if you do it correctly, don't have significant issues. So pros and cons of each, uh, they both have strong fixation. Uh, S2AI, you don't need an offset connector. Uh, if that's difficult, okay. Um, I don't think that's difficult. They're not really that much lower profile. Um, MIS, they might be more venable because you don't have the, the, the connector to deal with, but again, the, the run can be a little of an issue. Um, and we don't know the long-term durability of those S2AI. So uh, again, the moral of the story is adjunctive fixation below S1 is great. Iliac or S2AI, a little bit of dealer's choice. Just know the pros and cons of, of each of those. Uh, just a couple more cases how you can utilize all of those. Here's a patient that's uh, fused down to the bottom with uh, obviously the gross failure again, everything haloing out. Uh, difficult to get fixation. So here's an intraoperative uh, view where I put, uh, I was able to put some S1 screws, but I had to put them a little funky to get to some bone to grab. So I do have S1 screws and then I'm gonna uh, have some adjunctive fixation. I put uh, S2AIs and then a traditional iliac. So I used a combination of those. That's how I tend to use those uh, when I'm really looking for the best pelvic fixation. I think that could be nice because they connect up a little bit differently. Uh, 72 year old male, similar thing, uh, T10 to S1, uh, failing at the bottom, medial screw, uh, again revised with S1 screws, uh, but a combination of fixation techniques at the bottom. Uh, another combination technique for a, a tumor, some pelvic ring reconstructions where you're trying to, where you don't have a sacrum, you're trying to do it. There's some unique constructs tend to do this to reconnect the pelvic ring uh, as opposed to that anymore. Here's uh, what that, uh, that um, patient where we did the sacral resection on for the, that we showed you in the beginning, that's what that construct looks like uh, where you do an osteotomy at the sacrum. And again, more techniques of doing that. Uh, it's kind of a crazy one that Steve Andre used to do where he'd pull the rod all the way through, like in, out, in, like through them, which was kind of crazy. Um, but uh, he, he I was called it the crowd pleaser because uh, the people would all come around to watch him pull that thing through. But I don't do that anymore either. Um, so back to the case. Uh, this is at S1-2. We treat it with a, a, a pedicle subtraction osteotomy at the S2 level with ALAR osteotomies to realign the pelvis. Essentially, we did a, a closing wedge osteotomy of the sacrum uh, to reduce the pelvic incidence to bring them back into balance. Uh, and that's the before and after. So you can see a significant correction in sagittal alignment uh, with a relatively small operation actually in, in the grand scheme of things. And a few more of those cases I've done since then, uh, an even more uh, deformed patient there. The before and after, here's one that had a sacral fracture. Uh, Corrected another one. Uh, this is a myelomeningocele patient, which was something that was quite difficult uh, due to the anatomy there uh, that had failed there. So I ran into a problem here where if you look at all the metal down there, everything's touching. I wanted a little more correction, but I was done. All my metal touched. I couldn't compress anymore. Everything was touching. And the issue there is the alignment wasn't due to a, an abnormally elevated pelvic instance due to a, a uh, kyphosis at the sacrum. It was a normal sacrum, just a, a bad alignment, and, uh, and that made it difficult. So you can see everything, again, all the metal touching there got difficult. So, so in conclusion, oh, one more, too far. Um, 
you really need to understand that the sacral pelvic complex is, is biomechanically a complicated thing with a long segment fixation or high demand construct. The sacrum itself is, a, is your primary fixation point. Everything else is adjunctive. You need to optimize everything you can. Really well-placed S1 screws are critical. An inner body of some type in the 5-1 joint can offload that uh, as well. And uh, either traditional iliac or S2AI are your go-to techniques uh, to help offload those. And you should be facile with each. Practice them in the lab tomorrow. Thank you. Any questions? I've got 15 seconds David? for questions. Tyler. Yeah. I had a, uh, I had a chance to... Uh, uh, pick your brain slightly about this earlier, um, but uh, what is your opinion of kickstand rods? So uh, kickstand rods, uh, and I didn't show it, it's a rod that goes into the top of the iliac crest that goes off to the main construct where you can distract off of it if you have a uh, coronal imbalance, if you're trying uh, to push them over, if you're left with a little bit of residual imbalance. The benefit of that is you can fix that without undoing your whole construct. Uh, so if you're left with a little residual imbalance, it can be helpful. I think it's a helpful technique for that. I don't utilize it very often. I try and get that alignment through that correction of the fractional lumbosacral curve. Really, uh, I put an inner body and I try and really level that out as I'm doing my rod placement. I tend to do a translation derotation maneuver to pull it over, which tends to help correct that. Um, but it's, it's helpful to do that. I think it's a good technique to know. I always worry with additional metal, especially that rod that kind of comes all the way across where your fusion surface is. Um, the more metal you add, the less fusion surface you have, and the more you're holding the muscle up away from that. So I worry a little bit about the longevity of that. Does that bother people over time? It's kind of sticking up in that muscle a little bit. Um, so it's a, it's a rarity. If I, if I have a case, though, where I'm struggling to get that over as opposed to undoing the whole thing. It, it's certainly in my bag of tricks to utilize. The, uh, we've, we've used a, a kickstand rod for the originally intended purpose so that, that Lanky described, uh, but it's also become my go-to to anchor the third rod when um, in adding an additional rod um, into these deformity constructs. Is anybody else using kickstand rods? Juan, have you? I am. So, can I ask? <laughs> when you kickstand, we're falling victim to the uh, to the pressure from our residents to. Uh, when you kickstand for that third rod, though, how else are you connecting into the construct and where? Yeah, so I put an S2 screw to, to anchor the parent rod. Uh huh. And I put a, a direct iliac screw. Um, you know, with a properly seated head, mm -hmm. it's lateral to the S2, but not up high, so it doesn't become prominent. And then, uh, and I anchor it with W connectors um, higher up. Like two of those? Yeah, one or two, depending on how long I do it. And then, uh, and then, so I, I I picked this up from Chris Ames, and um, I, I've been asking the patients about this. So I only ha I don't have real data about this. This is just a series of anecdotes because mm -hmm. we've really been doing this consistently since November. Um, and uh, the patients have less pelvic pain early. So what I'm finding is that the patients mobilize with less pain early on. You're doing it unilaterally? Yeah, but uh, Can you tell sidedness? Yeah. No. But I'm going to ask you a question. Um, you know, you, you, I mean, with, with Tyler, it's simple. You go open and, you know, you can make these maneuvers. You don't have too many interbodies that mm -hmm. limits you, mm -hmm. you, what you're doing. In my case, because I know that you're doing a lot of laterals also. So the problem that I have with the kickstand is once I put the lateral cages, I get locked in, you know, and one of the biggest problems with MIS and deformity is the management of the coronal balance, you know. Mm -hmm. We've been heated by everybody in terms of sagittal balance, where I think is easier to correct, you know, you just do osteotomies, ACRs, but we just starting getting hit finally by the open guys that we don't do a good coronal balance. And actually, I'm just pulling all my data right now and my numbers, they don't look good, especially when you have a bad fractional curve. So the question is, 
can I handle MIS uh, kickstand having four or five levels of interbodies lateral when I don't have too much? I mean, how, what I'm going to do, I, I cannot move the spine more from that. So I was thinking maybe I should start these cases with the kickstand rod and then do all the lateral, fill in the gaps. I don't know, maybe, because I have to integrate these concepts into the MIS world somehow. You know, and this is what I've been doing all. You know, because MIS doesn't work if we don't follow the fundamentals and what it works in open, yeah? So I wanted to know what you guys, you know, Jay and, you know, Karikari, all of you guys that have a really good input, what you guys think can be a solution in the MIS world? So the, I mean, the problem I, well, and you obviously know a lot more than I do on, on passing rod and what you're connecting to. Those are connecting to offset connectors usually which mm -hmm. passing a rod into an offset connector, I don't know how you're going to do no, that. No, you have to create a... Yeah, um, like... No, you can create offset connector with the towers built in. You know, basically, you pass the, the uh, cross connector, and usually we do an adjacent segment failure. Mm -hmm. So you connect, uh, you put a cross connector between the two screws on the rod, and then the connector itself comes with a tower, and then you pass, you know, whatever is mm -hmm. coming, and you, you reduce it. But the question is, with the cages on it, I, I don't yeah. have a room to move the spine more somewhere, you know? And so what we do in MIS world is we, we tackle very hard 5-1, mm -hmm. trying to overcome the uh, fractional core, but still getting short, especially on, what is the name of the Chinese guy who made the classification on the coronal corpse? Ku Kuo? That, that, you know, he, he has three corps, A, B, and C. So the C corps, when the coronal yeah, yeah. balance is towards the Thank convex you. size, that are the one that uh, even the open guys have issues managing. Mm -hmm. MIS, all my C corps are tortured. At the point that right now, you know, I, I don't know, we're fishing here, our new fellow. We're trying to find out if every time from now on I have a C corp, actually I undercorrect the coronal or do something else because I'm, 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 you know, it's the classic patient that mm -hmm. comes to your clinic. Yep. Hey, Dr. Uribe, I'm doing good, but I didn't know that one of my legs is shorter than the <laughs> other one. I'm like, I, sure, I made it short yeah. for you, my friend. <laughs> so. so the difference in, in the sagittal versus coronal, sagittal plane is easier. Uh, you know, everybody was missing it, we weren't getting it. But think about it, you got a 10 degree range on your sagittal. If you're 10 degrees off from the base in your coronal, they're way off. Yeah. Right? So it's a, it, the, the margin of error is small to have a nice looking x ray. The, so. Clinically, people tolerate a malalignment better, but the, like, if you do it degree per degree, they don't tolerate it because it's really off. So, uh, and is so this for, for us as an MIS, the formative surgeons is that. We, few of us, if almost known, actually do a T-bar intra-op, trying to find out what the coronal balance is going on. We're just very proud because we put a bunch of cages and perk screws and rods and looks good. You I mean, know, so we need so, to actually, I mean, this is something that I'm calling all the us that we do in MIS. Can we really start looking deep into this? Yeah? I shoot a 36 inch, yeah, I either shoot a 36 inch film on every deformity yeah. after the rods are in, and I personally break and measure, and I measure their pre op film, so I get an EO, so I have leg length, so I know if their legs are even, and I measure from the top of their iliac crests and the top of their acetabulum, so I have two points to see how they stand naturally, what's higher than the other, and I measure the, to the vertical what that degree is. If it's 87 degrees, I'm trying to get 87 degrees, and I measure that in trap. I measure a line 87 degrees, and I want to make sure that. I'm bisecting up the top. Those top screws are going right down the middle there. Um, if they're right, if their legs are equal and they're standing a little bit off, I split the difference. I try and put it in the middle between that and 90, just in case there's a little bit of pelvic obliquity, unless it looks funny. Um, or if you do an O arm at the end, so oftentimes now I'll put my rods in before I even ready to spin. If it's before noon and my rods are in, I'll do an O arm and then I'll stitch the O arm films together. And there's a virtual T bar on the O arm. You can put. Like you can do, you can measure on that stitched film and put a line across that and it'll give you a perfect 90 off of there to make sure it levels out. So, I'm gonna try. Thank you. I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, I think Juan, the answer is gonna be in the disc space is to, you know, have cages that accommodate a coronal correction.